Thank each one for the speech and music this morning. It's been great. I know that you have been blessed already this morning just by being in the house of God <coughs> to recognize Christ as Lord and Master over all. And because God loves us, God's given to us His Word to show us how to live, how to understand life today. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to the Gospel of Genesis. It's the Gospel of Genesis. Genesis is good news. That's what the word gospel means. The gospel means good news. Let's turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 6, for some good news this morning. Before I speak, let's pause for a moment and ask God by His Holy Spirit to speak to our heart and life today. Let's pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we lift our hearts and hands in praise unto you this morning. For great is our God, and greatly to be praised. We're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity that has been ours this morning to join together in worship unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, I pray now as we open the word of God, that likewise you will open our hearts. I pray, Lord, that as we look into your word this morning, that we may find hope. I pray, our Father, that as we look into your word today, we may find a reason to live, a reason to rejoice. May we discover in your word today God's will. And I pray, our Father, that for those of us who know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that when we leave the house of God today, we will leave walking tall. <coughs> knowing that we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, knowing in our heart that our God is in control, knowing in our heart that we do have a friend in Jesus. Lord, I pray that for those who may be here this morning without Jesus Christ, I pray that even now that your Holy Spirit will begin to minister to those lives. And I pray, our Father, that before we leave this sanctuary today, that for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, may this be a day of commitment. May this be a day when life will begin anew and afresh. May this be the day that when we leave this sanctuary, that the joy of the Lord will go with us, that you will lift us up, that we might be good witnesses for Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, Father, to this end, and for the glory of God, we ask now that you speak to us through your word. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. <coughs> Already battered and bloody, she was fleeing for, for her life from a woman carrying a knife. As she fled down the street, she came upon a group of teenagers who were hanging out on the street corner. The teenagers knocked her to the ground and kicked her, <coughs> stepped on her. One of the teenagers hit her with a bottle. And they all yelled out, kill her, kill her, kill her. The woman who had been pers uh, pursuing with the knife stabbed her to death. Sounds like the scene from a horror movie. Actually, it is the scene from the streets of Oakland, California on August the 11th of this year. 19-year-old girl stamped to death another lady. Let's see, how could that happen? How could there be such a brutal, senseless murder? But more than that, how can a group of teenagers be turned into a pack of wild, raging animals? How could that happen in our society? And if you move closer to home, you've all read in the papers and seen on TV the young serviceman 
who killed his wife, cut her up in pieces, put her in the refrigerator, and then called to let it be known what he had done before he attempted suicide. And the list goes on and on and on and on. We live today in a very violent world. Violence has become a way of life. We not only see it and hear it in the movies and in the music, but we also see it on the daily news. The violence has become a way of life. Who would have guessed? Who would even have thought in their wildest imagination 20 years ago that in this year that uniformed police officers would have to patrol the halls of the public schools. Who would have thought the time would come when in, even in the schools that metal detector devices would have to be used to reveal concealed weapons in the school. Yes, we are living in a very, very violent world. Violence has become almost an accepted part of life today. Do you realize that almost nothing shocks us anymore? We read of these things of murders and brutality and all of these things that happen in our world today and all we can say is, well, that's too bad. Almost nothing shocks us anymore. We've heard it all. We've seen it all. And it is not happening only in the large cities. Violence has become a way of life in the small towns. And guess what? Violence has become a way of life even in the home. How many young children are battered and bruised for life? Many even killed in their own homes. Together with violence, there is a flood of moral perversion in our world. To the everything from abortion to assisted suicide to pornography to homosexuality. And the list goes on and on and on and on. We live in a world today that is filled with violence and immorality. And we wonder what's happened to our world. What's happened to decent human life? What's happened to a time when people cared about each other? What happened to the days when you were not afraid to walk on the streets at night alone? What happened to the days when you could go to the shopping center and park your car and walk into the store without fear that you might be attacked on the way to the store or return from the store? What's happened in our world today? Why this flood of violence and pornography? Let me tell you this morning. What we are seeing in our world today is mankind at his best without God. That's what we are seeing in our world today. When we look around us and see all of the wickedness and the violence and the immorality that is rampant in our world, what you are seeing is mankind at his very best without God. Look with me, if you will, in Genesis chapter 6 this morning and verse 5. There was a day when God looked down upon the world that he had created. Look at verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There was a time in past history when God looked in upon a world and he saw a world that was filled with violence. A world where life was almost worthless. A world that was filled not only with violence, but with total immorality. You know what happened. When God saw the violence and the wickedness in this world, God sent a flood. And the Bible tells us that in this flood, every human being was destroyed with the exception of Adam <coughs> and Eve, right? 
Okay, I just might make sure you're with me. Okay, everyone was destroyed in the flood, with the exception of Noah and his family. Why were they destroyed? The Bible says because their wickedness had filled the land. Wickedness filled the land and God said, I'm going to destroy the world. After the flood was over, Noah offered a sacrifice to God. I want you to turn with me while we're in the book of Genesis to chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. Noah offered a sacrifice to God. God received that sacrifice. Verse 21, the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I smite any more every living thing as I have done. Two things God says to us in this passage. Number one, God says, I will never again destroy the world by water. That's not going to happen again. The second thing God says, that even after the flood, after all wickedness had been destroyed, God said, I know mankind. And even from the days of his youth, even from the time a person is very, very young, his heart and mind is filled with wickedness. Even the very imagination, man's mind is filled with violence. Man's mind is filled with all kinds of evil. God knew it. And God said, I will never again destroy the world by water, but this I know. That man is evil, filled with evil and violence, even from his very youth. But then he man turned to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Notice what Peter reminds us in verse 3. 2 Peter 3, verse 3. Peter says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffing, walking after their own lust, and say, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Notice what Peter is saying. Peter is saying that there is going to come a time in history when man will say almost literally, Jesus Christ is not coming again. All of this thing about religion, oh, it's a thing of the past. It's not going to happen. People have been saying for years and years and years that Jesus is coming again. We don't see any evidence of that. Peter says they are, they are ignorant of this one thing. That there was a time when the world became wicked and that God literally destroyed the world by water. Let's go on and see what he has to say. Verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word. That's the word of God. By the word of God, because God said so, the world was destroyed by water. Peter says the heavens and the earth that is now by the same word, by the word of God, are kept in store, notice, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slightness, but His long-suffering to us were. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Notice the next verse. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You put these two together. There was a time in the beginning when the world was filled with wickedness and violence and immorality and God said, I will destroy the world. And He did, with the exception of Noah and his family. 
Peter comes along and says, listen, I want you to understand this, that by the same word, this world that we are now living in, one day, by the word of God, will again be destroyed. This world that we now live in, one day, will be destroyed. Why? Because of wickedness. Wickedness will so fill the land. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 24, we are told that if mankind was left to himself, that he would literally destroy himself. But the Bible says before man destroys himself, something is going to happen. The same Lord who ascended back into heaven <coughs> made a promise, I am going to come again. He is going to come again. And on that day when Jesus Christ comes again, into a world that is filled with violence and immorality. He is coming again to bring judgment. He is coming again to destroy a world that is filled with violence. Now, I want to share with you some good news this morning. I want to share with you why the world has become so violent and immoral. We look around us today, we have all kinds of reasons. The sociologists and the psychologists and all, they have all of these reasons why we are living the way we are. Why is it that teenagers are so violent today? Why is it that adults are so violent today? Why is it that we treat each other like we do? There's all kinds of reasons given, but the Word of God gives you the real reason. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Book of Romans chapter 1. Now before I share with you why we are living in such a violent world, why things are as they are, first of all, I want to give you some good news. And the good news is found in verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The good news is about Jesus Christ. The good news is simply this. That in Jesus Christ there is salvation. Now hear me. In Jesus Christ the good news is that Jesus Christ can come into our life and change us completely. Jesus Christ can come into our life and take away all of the hatred and all of the violence and all of the immorality. He can give us a brand new life. That's what the Bible says when it talks about being born again. When we are born again, we're born into the life, first of all, through Adam. We are born with the nature that Jesus, that God spoke about in the book of Genesis. When God says, I know mankind, man is evil from his youth. That's why Jesus Christ came. Jesus came and now by believing in him and accepting him, our whole life can be changed. You see, a lot of people have the idea today, well, the church is good. It's great to have a church. It's even good to go to church. It's even good to join the church. But listen, I'm here to tell you this morning the good news about Jesus Christ is that He changes your life. He changes your life. <laughs> Jesus Christ can come into your life and He can take away all of the wickedness and place in your life all of His goodness. That's why Christ came. That's the good news. The good news is about Jesus Christ and His life. Let's look at verse 17. For therein, that is, in the gospel, the good news about Christ, you find the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, it is written, the just shall live by faith. In the word of God, you find revealed God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? God's righteousness simply means this, God's right way of living. And when we begin to live God's way, then we begin to experience life as God intended it to be. I am a firm believer that even in a world of violence, even in a world that is filled with fear and all of these things, I am convinced, I know the Word of God, that God's people can come to know Jesus Christ, invite Him into their life, become personally acquainted with Him, and their whole life is changed and can begin to live a life that is filled with peace and joy and happiness today. I don't mean when you get to the kingdom of God. A lot of people have the idea, well, I'll accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, and one day, someday, in the sweet by and by, it's going to get better. Well, it will. But let me tell you, 
when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your sins are forgiven and you're born again in the kingdom of God, it gets better and better today. It gets better and better today. And if your life as a Christian is not better than it was the day before, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Christ came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's today. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. God's word shows us how to live. And when we begin to live that way, then we experience life as God intended. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. How is God's wrath revealed from heaven? What you notice is, I am a firm believer that God is in absolute control of His world. He created the world. He has never turned the world over to anyone else. He is in control. Now, I asked the question this morning. The scripture says, the wrath of God is revealed. How is it revealed? How is that revealed? Now, before he gives the evidence, he tells us why the evidence is there. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. How has he showed it unto them? Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What is he saying? He is saying here that it is evident to all of mankind the power of God, that there is a God in heaven who created the world. There is a God in heaven who, by looking out into the universe, you have to know that there is a powerful God. You have to know there is someone in control of our world. The Bible says the evidence is there. All around us there is the evidence that God is God and that this God is in control. Here we see verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain, I notice, became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. What did Genesis say? Genesis said that man in his heart is only wicked, evil continually. The very imagination of his heart is only evil. Paul comes along and says, listen, all the evidence you need that there is a God is out there in the world around you. But mankind ignores that. Man ignores the fact that God is God. The evidence is there if you will look at it. Now, let's look at the evidence of God's wrath in the world. Verse 24. <clears throat> Wherefore, God gave them up unto uncleanliness. Now listen, why is God doing that? Because man knows that there is a God. Man knows because he looks out into God's world. Also, God has put a God consciousness in your heart. And the fact that you know there is a God, you can't get away from that. Down deep in the heart of every man, there is a God consciousness that we know there is a God. We can't get away from that. We also know that they, we are going to stand before that God one day in judgment. You say, how do you know that? Because the Word says so. I don't have to argue with you that you know there's a God. You know it. People say they're atheists, they're lying. According to the Word of God, there's no such thing as an atheist. Every person knows in their heart that there is a God. They may deny it. I may deny that you're here in this sanctuary this morning. It doesn't alter the fact that you are there. Every person knows that there is a God. Every person knows that one day they're going to stand before God and get an account of Him in judgment. The only thing that remains is what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? According to the Word of God, God gave them up to uncleanness, verse 24, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God, now notice, God gave them up unto vile affections. 
For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meet. There's the evidence. How is God's wrath poured out upon his world? God says, okay, you don't want to recognize me? You don't want to recognize that I'm God? Then I will turn you over to your own self. I will let you see yourself at your best without God. And when God turns man over to himself, all of this wickedness is going to flow. You say, why are we living in a world that is filled with so much homosexuality? There's the answer. When man refuses to believe in God and refuses to accept God and rather wants to live without God, God says, okay, live it your way. And all of the moral perversion we have in our world today is simply evidence that God is God. It is simply the evidence that the wrath of God is poured up on His world. Now, I'm not going just much further this morning. I'd like to, but I'm just here to tell you this. The Word of God says that all of the moral perversion we see in our world today is simply because man refuses to acknowledge God and God says, okay, I'll turn you over unto yourself. Verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they knew there was a God, didn't want to acknowledge it. God gave them over to a reprobate, and that word reprobate means a depraved mind. To do those things which are not convenient things they ought not to do. Why are we having so much violence in our world? Why are we having so much evil in our world today? The scripture says that even as man did not want to retain God, even when man said, I'm not going to believe in God, I'm not going to accept God's way, I'm going to do it my way, God says, fine. I'll show you my wrath. What we see in our world today, all of the violence, all of the wickedness is the evidence of God's wrath upon this world. God says, okay, I'll turn you over to yourself. And you will go out and you will murder, you will kill. There will be such brutality in the world that you have never seen before. Because God gives man over to himself. Now the problem you find there in verse 28 they did not like to retain God in their mind. They want to believe there's God. Listen, the problem is God has given to us a freedom of choice. God has given to every man, and every woman, every boy and girl the option to believe and obey God or not to believe and obey God. And when man chooses not to believe and not to obey God, then we have a world that is filled with violence and hatred and perversion until finally judgment comes. We see so many Christians today walking and wringing their hands, I don't know what this world's coming to. I know what it's coming to. I know what it's coming to, but I also know there's good news. The good news is it makes no difference who you are. Listen, if you refuse to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you refuse to live as He would have you live, there is going to come a day of judgment and you are going to be cast into that lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those in Noah's day, for 120 years while the ark was being prepared, they saw Noah and they heard Noah, no doubt, saying to them, God is going to send judgment. Oh, sure He is. Sure He is. There are many today, and you may be one of them. You've heard over and over and over again in your life that Jesus Christ is going to come again. You've heard in your life that one day when Jesus comes again, there's going to be a judgment. And those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ and refuse to live for Him are going to be destroyed in a literal burning hell fire. And you're saying, oh sure, oh sure. But remember what Peter said. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He is coming again. That's the Word of God. Because man refuses to acknowledge God. Notice verse 20. This is what happened. And I'm going to read this for you in another version. Beginning at verse 29. Because they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. 
They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, <laughs> insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Doesn't that sound like our world today? Because man refuses to accept God, man refuses to live God's way, God says all of these things are going to happen, and they're happening in our world today. You want to know why there's so much violence? Do you want to know why we have so much brutality in our world today? There's the answer. It's in God's Word. Man has turned his back upon God and said, God, I'm going to live my way. God says, okay, you live your way. And the, the righteous wrath of God is already revealed. Look out into your heart. Listen to the news. Your news will give you every evidence that the wrath of God has already been poured out upon our world. When man refuses to acknowledge God, God says, okay, have it your way. And when you have it your way, there's going to be all kinds of evil and violence and immorality. Even to the point where man would destroy himself unless Jesus comes again. The good news this morning is simply this. That there is hope and there is life in Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Sin dominates our life without God. If you do not have God in your life and you're not living in obedience to God's Word, you're living in sin. Sin dominates our life. We need help. And there's only one person who can help, and his name is Jesus. That's why Jesus... Listen, if we can have a good old-fashioned revival where God's people got right with God and began to live like God's people and began to pray as God's people should pray. We can see a revival and we can see a reversal of what's happening in our world. God changes lives. You want to see things turn around? You want to see our world become a better place to live? There's only one way and that's through Jesus Christ. You say, well, has it gotten too far? Is it too late? I don't know. But I know this, it's not too late for you. It's not too late for your neighbors and your friends. Then God's people pray, and God's people begin to believe, then God begins to act. And God can change our life and prepare. Listen, I am thoroughly convinced that one day in the very near future, I mean the very near future, Jesus Christ is going to come back into his world. God promised in the beginning, I will never again destroy the world by water. That's his promise. Don't you notice the other promise? The other promise is that one day he is going to destroy his world by fire. And it's only those who by their own free will choose to believe in Jesus Christ, choose to receive him as their Savior, and choose to live for him that will have eternal life in God's kingdom. And that's good news. That's good news. All that I see around me lets me know the coming of Jesus Christ is very, very near. The only question you've got to answer in your life this morning, am I ready for that coming? Have I really made a commitment in my life to Jesus Christ? I'm shocked at what's going on in our world. I'm shocked. It's almost unbelievable what is happening. But then I go to the Word, and the Word says, this is exactly what is going to happen when man is left to himself and ignores God. There can be a change in your life. You say, well, I would never do those things. Maybe not. But your life needs to be changed. Jesus is coming again. Listen, He's coming back for those who are prepared, not those who live right. That may sound like a contradiction. There are a lot of people today who say, well, I, I live right. I don't do anybody wrong. I live the very best I can. Listen, the Bible tells me Jesus Christ is coming back for those who are prepared. For those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I don't know when He's coming, but I know He's coming soon. And the good news this morning is this. You can have a friend in Jesus. The Bible says there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and his name 
is Jesus. Let me ask you in closing this morning. Do you know in your heart that you're right with God? Do you know in your heart that if Jesus were to come right now, that you would be saved in His kingdom? You know it. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ, I don't care how you live, you're not ready. You look out there in the world and see all the wickedness and the violence. According to the Word of God, that's the evidence that the coming of Christ is near at hand. I'm looking forward to that day when there will be no more wickedness, no more sin, no more violence. I'm looking forward to the day when we'll be in the kingdom of God to live forever and ever. But if you want to be there, you've got to make plans now. Get ready now. Live for Christ now. It's worth it today. And your future depends on it. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful for the Word of God. Lord, as we look out into our world and, and we read the news and we see all of the, the wickedness and the violence that has taken place in our world and things that, that shock us day after day. And Lord, oftentimes we are, we're made to wonder, why is this happening? How can this happen? But then we go to the Word and we discover that all of these things are evidence that man has turned his back upon God and that the world is being filled with wickedness and violence and perversion. And all of this reminds us that our God, who is still in control, one day is going to send His only begotten Son back into the world to redeem, to deliver us from violence, to give us eternal life in a kingdom that will never end. Lord, in these closing moments, I pray that the Spirit of the living God will speak to us individually. Lord, you know our hearts and our lives. Holy Spirit, I pray that even now you will bring conviction where it is needed. Oh God, I pray that somehow, some way, that we may catch a glimpse of just where we are in history. That we may catch a glimpse that soon and very soon the trumpet's going to sound and Jesus is going to return. Lord, there may be those here today who would not be ready if you would come. The evidence is all around us. Help us, Lord, not to ignore that. Help us to acknowledge it. And then to allow Christ to come into our life to be Lord over all. Father, speak to us now. And if we need to make commitments, Lord, help us to step out of our pews where we are and come to this altar. Make a commitment to Christ for life today. In Jesus' name I pray.